uh, several, several years ago, I went to the country Thailand, and while I was in Thailand, I mean, this is like the goofiest country I've ever visited in my life. It's like really up there, and I've visited several, because here's right downtown, they have a grub cart. I kid you not, a grub cart. Check this out. Look, look at that. Th those are grubs. I'm not talking like, ooh, rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub grubs. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking bugs, okay? Bugs, insects, worms, everything, right? I mean, check, 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 check. It, this isn't like just for tourists. This was the real, this is what they eat, okay? I mean, it's like, oh my goodness. It's like, at least it's not kumquat, but, but oh my goodness, it's still, you know, ugly, ugly bugs to eat. It's like, ugh. And in case you don't know, geography lessons, the red spot, that's where, um, th that's where Thailand is, okay? And that's, that's where I went. And specifically, here's Thailand zoomed in. I need to share this with you. I went to a city called Rayong. I was supposed to go to Phi Phi Island. <sighs> I really wanted to go to Phi Phi Island. I really did. I just wanted to take a picture of me going in and out of the bathroom there. You can guess why. Because <laughs> I am so mature. Okay? So I really wanted to go there. But in case you hadn't, might have forgotten, a big wave of tsunamis flew through the area, or flew through, went through the area, killing like hundreds of thousands of people. And 100% of the people on PP Island died. Okay? And it happened two days before my arrival. So we had to change our plan. So we went to this little city called Rayong. It's right there. Er, er, there it is. Itty bitty little. See where it is on the ocean there? Okay, this was a wild, wild city. By a wild city, I mean literally wild. Like this is the picture from my hotel window of a wild jungle. Like you die if you walk through that. Okay, there is wild cobras, wild monkeys, tiger, anything. It's there. It is wild, wild jungle. Like literally, the, not a park to look like the jungle. It's the real deal. It's Indiana Jones jungle, okay? There's no fences. There's no signs that says warning tigers will eat you. It's just going to happen if you walk through it, okay? That's the jungle, okay? So, so there's, and, and notice that there's like buildings in the jungle, who builds a house in a jungle without taming it to some degree first? I don't like a retaining wall or something. But then on the other side of my same hotel room, okay, so this is out the side window of the bedroom, out the living room hotel window was this. Now, I had never in my life swam in the ocean before. Never done it. Never seen salt water, okay? Never seen it before. This is a true story. So... I decided, look, surely if it's designed to look like that, there's swimming areas. Surely that's what that is, right? Wouldn't you think if this looks like that all the way up and down the coastline, those are designated swimming areas? That's what my brain goes because I think, you know, First world American civilization. That's what I'm thinking. I wasn't thinking wild jungle. The ocean's wild too. I wasn't thinking that. So I decided I'm going swimming. Who's with me? And they said, seriously? I said, yeah, let's go. I'm walking across the street. The people I was with were like, is this safe? I'm like, it's, look at it. It looks like a place where you're supposed to swim. So let's do this. So I walk, I walk onto the beach. And as I'm on the beach, there's these little crabs coming up out of the sand running back down in the sand. I go, oh, that's so cool. And then it dawned on me, what if it came up while my foot was right there? You know, so I'm just like, I'm going to try it. So I'm like trying to step on the crabs. It was like my own personal body, you know, whack-a-mole. You know, I'm just in here just trying to step on all the crabs. They're going, beep, 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 beep. it was so much fun. So then the time came and I went out into the water. And as I'm walking out into the water, I take a step, I'm about ankle deep. I took about another step and then went, boom, and another step, boom, and it was knee deep. I took about three more steps, and it was waist deep. Took another step, and it was up to my chest. And, and, and I kid you not, I couldn't see my knees. It was so murky. So I'm like 10 feet from the shore, but I'm like this deep, and it's murky. Do you know what's in an ocean when it's a deep drop-off really fast in murky water and undesignated populated swimming zones. You know what swims in there? Any guesses? Sharks, okay? Now, I, I didn't know. I didn't think about sharks, okay? Until I got about that deep. I looked down, I couldn't see my knees. Suddenly, I began feeling something. 
I, it wasn't on my body. <laughs> Nothing was brushing up against me. But I felt like I was being watched. Have you ever had that feeling? That, that, you're, that something's like right there. Anyone who owns a cat knows what I'm talking about. It's that moment where you just feel like it's just too quiet. Something's going to pounce. Okay, and so I'm just looking around, and it just dawned on me. My brain finally connected the dots. Ocean, wild jungle, ocean, salt water, murky, Thailand, which is known for having bull sharks and tiger sharks. Suddenly, my brain began painting a picture, and it sang a song. You know what the song was? Bum, bum. Bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. I walked on water. I did. I got, I'm flying out as fast as I could. Other people, they, they, they saw me going out. So what they do, they swam all the way to the rocks, like 30 feet out. And they're sitting on the rocks. I'm going, they're like, what are you doing? I said, shark. They go, you saw one? I'm like, no, but I'm afraid there might be one. And then suddenly everybody's freaking out because our brains told ourselves a story that wasn't true. Was there a shark? I don't know. I mean, there could have been. There definitely was way out somewhere. It's the ocean, for crying out loud. But that's what happens with fear. Fear tells our, 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 a story. That's what fear does. It tells ourselves a story. And then our body believes it to be true. Have you ever been scared and then realized you were really scared of nothing? Or you felt like an idiot having been scared of that? It's like the other day I was grilling and suddenly a bunny rabbit shot out from under the, the grill cover and went across my feet. Now, I know I'm not the epitome of masculinity. You guys laughed way too much at that. <laughs> I know I'm not like uber butch or anything, but I'm not scared of a bunny. But when that bunny went across my feet, you know what I did? I about covered my grill in barbecue sauce. I'm sitting there barbecue all of a sudden, you know, it scared me. Why? My brain painted a picture for me. And it wasn't painting a picture of bunny. You know, it, was, it painted a picture of a bear. Why? I don't know. My brain went to a bear. It's a bitty miniature bear. And it said, it's going to run up your leg and bite you. And it freaked me out. I went, ah! Okay? It was a bunny. Cute little itty bitty bear. Its ears weren't even fully grown yet. Okay? But that's what fear does. It paints a picture in your head of something that's not true. But your body says you're right. And it freaks out, and we, and our, we behave in goofy ways. And we do choices that we regret later. Because we let ourselves be controlled by fear, and we don't stop to analyze whether the thought is accurate. Okay, so that's what we're going to have to do. Now, in some cases, somebody jumps out at you. You're going to go, blah! You know, and that, you can't avoid that. That's that instinct little, you know, it doesn't always look like that. Just for me. <laughs> You know, uh, like when I scare our secretary, she just goes, oh, like that. And she just doesn't even put her hands up. I'm like, come on, please put your hands up. Defend yourself. You know, <laughs> you know but we, we, when we get, we, we can't avoid that type of fear, but we can avoid the fear where we think we have predicted the future and we know the outcome and we make choices in the present based upon a false future. And we let fear dictate our behavior. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at today, is that Jesus is being arrested. People, the disciples, are going to be afraid. And they're going to paint for themselves a picture that might be accurate, it might not be accurate. That they are painting themselves a picture in their mind, and that they are afraid of that picture being a reality. And so then they make choices in the present for wrong. They make misunderstood choices, misinformed choices. They sin. That's what they do because of a perceived future that may or may not even be accurate. I mean, how many people are scared to go on a plane? A couple of people. Why? Because you're afraid it's going to crash. My mom, will, my mom will not fly overseas. She will not fly over water because she's afraid of falling in the ocean, surviving, and being eaten by sharks. That, so she won't fly over to another country for that reason alone. She has told me that repeatedly. I will not go. Why? There's sharks in them waters. 
and? <laughs> okay, because our mind tells us that story. So let's check this. Let's see the situation here. So where we left off before, Jesus is going to pray because he's about to be arrested, beaten, crucified, die, tortured. Okay, so he is afraid over an impending doom that he knows is a reality. He responds with prayer, needing to pray. As he's praying, his disciples, they're prayer warriors. They did a great job praying for him, right? No, they fell asleep. They fell asleep, not just once, not just twice, but three times. That is recorded. It could have even been more. Who knows? Okay, but they fell asleep instead of praying with and for Jesus. So while Jesus is waking them up, he comes back, he kicks them. Wake up! What's wrong with you? Okay, I don't know if it was like he decided to be Italian for a moment. What's the matter with you? And then he starts kicking them. I have no idea. But nonetheless, Jesus is frustrated. And while he was still, verse 49 of chapter 26 in Matthew, while he, Jesus, was still speaking, he is telling them, wake up, wake up, guys. You don't understand. The hour is now. My betrayer is coming. Here he comes. While he is saying these words, Judas, one of the 12, Matthew points out the irony here of this because Jesus is being betrayed by a close friend, one of the 12 disciples. So Judas, one of the 12, uh, arrived with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas says, Greetings, Rabbi. Remember, anyone who calls Jesus Rabbi or teacher is not a true follower of Jesus. They're a pretender. Okay, so we have greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. This is the forever echoing kiss of the Judas kiss of betrayal. Now, people begin wondering, how big was this crowd? I know it seems silly, but it is actually an important question. It's not just trivia. It's not just academics. It's actually important. How big was this crowd? Let's just do a, a quick poll. Who thinks like 15 people showed up? Anybody say about 15, 20 people is how big this crowd was. Anybody? No? How many say 15? 50, 50 people. Anybody want to say 50? I can go with 50. I can go with 50. Okay. 100? And we say, yeah, let's go with 100. 100 people showed up. I mean, that's like, that's, that's like this whole church showing up to arrest Jesus. Okay, that's kind of what's going on. It's 100. Maybe, maybe like 200. 200 people? You might say, that's just really, really. Anybody want to say it's more than 200 people? Yeah, nobody's doing that. Well, here's the funny thing. The word used in Matthew here for large crowd means crowd. There's no number attached to it. Isn't that helpful? But the Gospel of John, it doesn't give a number, but gives a particular word for a type of crowd that it was that usually means a crowd of 600 people. Okay, now people are fighting over this. Academics are fighting. His scholars are fighting, saying, well, you don't understand. Sometimes, in rare occasions, this word can also mean 200 people. So you are just trying to exaggerate it. So you're just trying to exaggerate. So you know what? It's usually 600 people that is understood by that word. But some people say it should be 200. In my mind, does it really matter at that point? You know, because how many people are Jesus and company? How many people? Twelve. Okay, remember, eleven disciples and Jesus. Don't forget Jesus. Some of you mouthed eleven. There's eleven people. Well, Jesus counts. Okay, so you got twelve versus, let's go with the smallest number. So how many? 201. Don't, miss, don't forget Judas. <laughs> it was like 200. Uh, 201. Okay, now, this is the situation. Picture this now. You got 12 people and then 201 minimum showing up. Can we say that Jesus' disciples are greatly outnumbered? Okay, now, this might seem like totally bizarre to point out, but here's why this is important because of what happens next called the begging of Jesus. I, I like the letter B today. The begging of Jesus. So Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. The word friend does not mean he's literally calling him his friend. It is a sarcastic insult. Kind of like Lord of the Rings, where Gandalf calls Saruman friend. Okay, so this is not a compliment. It's more of a, you're my enemy, but I'm saying friend because we aren't supposed to be. 
catch that. Okay, so then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. So now, here it comes. They are grabbing Jesus. They got the cuffs out. They're singing the song, bad boy, bad boy, what you gonna do? All right, okay, they got it going. They think they're all on the right, and they're ready for this, okay? So now comes the battle. Check this out. With that, with the arrest of Jesus, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, think of this. What's this what are the numbers again? How many were Jesus and company? Twelve. How many were the army? 201 minimum. Maybe 601, right? Okay. Twelve versus hundreds. Who does this guy think he is? You know, I mean, we know later that it's Peter. That's, that's what the Gospel of Mark and John tell us. But, but Matthew doesn't tell us. That. He just says one of Jesus' servants went over to the high priest. John also tells us that it's Malchus is the guy's name who lost his ear. But I'm like, what is Peter thinking? How bizarre of, a, of, an, of an action is this? 200 people coming at you. I mean, what, did he think he was a Spartan? Like, this is Jesus. And then kick people down a hole? I mean, what is he thinking with this? This is really bizarre. And then Peter's a bad shot. Right? Because he went to swing at the guy. And did he kill him? No. He just cuts off his ear. And that's just irritating. Oh, come on. You know that one was irresistible. <laughs> Eerie, isn't it? I could go a long time for this. But anyway, so, so he cuts off his ear. Praise the Lord for cutting off his ear. Because if Peter had killed him, Peter would have to be arrested. This actually saved Peter's life, allowing ministry to go. So sometimes if you think you missed the shot, sometimes you think you missed, you're like, I never miss. How on earth did I miss? You might just want to thank the Lord for that. Might have been consequences had you been dead on accurate. And so here's Peter, ready for battle, okay? And he's like, and he, remember, he said, Jesus, I will not deny you. Jesus said, uh-huh. And Peter went, uh-uh. Jesus went, uh-huh. So Peter's trying to prove Jesus wrong. Keep in mind, what did Jesus say was going to happen? He was going to get arrested. What is Peter trying to do? Prove Jesus wrong with his sword. Okay, so he's out. He's like, yeah, and he's battle crying. He's swinging. He's whacking. Okay, Jesus rebukes him. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. This is not Jesus being anti-war. God is not anti-war. Okay, there are time and a place for it, and Jesus will start war in the book of Revelation at the second coming. He's not anti that. He is simply telling Peter, hey, violence begets violence. This is God's will. This is what's supposed to happen. Put that away. You're not going to overthrow God with a sword. It's not going to happen Peter. Okay, so he said, just put that away. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions or thousands of angels? Do you not think I could just call at a moment and bring 12,000 angels down here to set everything on fire? Do you think I couldn't do that? I can take care of myself, Peter. That's Jesus' statement here. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Jesus is trying to get Peter to see the bigger picture here. It's like, see it all. This is not just about the present. There's more at play here than just politics. There's more at play here than just Judas' betrayal. This is the salvation of the world here. There's so much at stake. Peter, the scriptures predicted this. They must be fulfilled. It is going to happen. Peter, there is no way around this. There is no battle. There is no fighting this. This is happening. This is the situation of Jesus. So then Jesus turns to the crowd and he is actually offended at them. Not because they're fulfilling scripture, but because there's so many of them. 
And Jesus says, in that hour, Jesus came to the crowd. Am I leading a rebellion that you have to come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Basically saying, dude, you could have came up to me, just one of you, and I just would have went and take me away. Okay, you didn't need this. Have I ever started a fight? Have I ever started a quarrel? Do you see me armed to the teeth? Do you see me with Uzis and rocket launchers and army boots? No, my mama wears the army boots, but I'm fine. I don't, I'm, I'm sandaled. It's fine. So he's like, you really did all this? Every day, he said, I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place. He's telling everybody so they can see that something has changed now that wasn't the case a week ago. They could have arrested him a week ago, but they didn't. Okay, something has changed. Something's at play. There's a bigger story here being told, a bigger event that's being unfolded. So well, what, has taken, what has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled? Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Notice, what did the disciples do? They ran. They deserted, fulfilled. Yes, Jesus said, that the shepherd would be stricken, everybody would be gone. Everybody's gone. They all fled. Why did they flee? They weren't the ones being arrested. Why did they run? They weren't the ones that had the warrant out. They weren't the ones being sought after. Judas was going to kiss how many people? One. Did anybody give chase to the disciples? Did the other soldiers say, hey, get back here? No. Because they weren't the ones that were being hunted for. So I want you to notice that. Okay, we're going to come back to that issue in a little bit. But I want you to notice that the disciples fled. Nobody gave chase. Nobody followed. Nobody put pictures on trees nailed up saying looking for 11 disciples. Nobody did that. There's no warrant out for the disciples' arrest. There's no uh, any type of statute or ordinance or anything saying look out. There's no APB. Okay, there's no all-point bulletin for the disciples at this case. So they just fled out of what? Fear. Over what might be for them. Over what might be for them. Now comes a long section of scripture as the story begins to unfold. So check this out. We'll call it the booing of Jesus where people are just trying to falsely accuse him and insult him and try to do away with him. Verse 57, those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But, I want you to notice this. Underline this if you're a writer in your Bible. But Peter followed him, where? At a distance. Right up to the court courtyard of the high priest he entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome okay if they were wanting to arrest the disciples where is peter sitting next to the guards okay it's like it's like your, your friend of yours gets arrested and you go to the police station and you sit down next to the police because you want to know what's happening with your friend but you feel safe doing that why because they're not looking for you they wanted your friend. That's who they got. That's who's in jail. Okay, so that's what's going on. So Peter's not being looked for. He's sitting next to the guards, free will, free choice, sat down, not cuffed, not seized, not in shackles or chains. He's just sitting down next to the guards to see what's happening to Jesus. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any this has got to be a weirdest case of Judge Judy you've ever seen. Okay, because here they are, the TV cameras are rolling. They're like, we got, we got evidence. Oh, it contradicts. We got witnesses. They contradict. Well, and all of it's being thrown out. What evidence do you got? And we got nothing. <laughs> nothing was working. They did not find any. Though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared. Finally, two people that agreed on the same lie. Whew. Finally, we got two people. So two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. This is why they agreed Jesus actually said that. <laughs> Funny what happens when the truth comes into play. Okay, I could do it in three days. Of course, Jesus was referring to his body. 
He was not referring to the building structure of the temple like how they're meaning it here. They're making Jesus look like a terrorist, like he's showing up with a vest and dynamite in it. That's how they're making Jesus look a little bit. Then the high priest stood and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. How many of you have the guts to remain silent even when someone's speaking falsely about you? See, we struggle with that. Someone says something false about us, we gotta somehow just go, Rah! and we get arrogant, and we get violent and aggressive, and we, especially on like Facebook, someone types something about you that's kind of negative, and you go, oh, I can't believe they said that. Oh, wait till you see my gif. Oh yeah, this is really gonna show you. It's animated. <laughs> and we just kind of get all freaked out about it. Somebody says something wrong about you, is it true? No, and anyone who knows you is gonna know that. So Jesus remained silent, gutsy, very gutsy. We wouldn't have the guts for that. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. That's kind of ironic. I swear Jesus by you. <laughs> but they didn't know. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said, your words, you've said so. It's a way of not saying, yes, I am, by also not denying it either. Jesus is like, you know what? You said so. Yeah, that, that's, that's what you're saying. I'm not going to disagree. I'm not going to deny, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus talks about his return. Then the high priest tore his clothes because that's what they do back in that time period. They would just rip out of anger and out of anguish. They're like, oh, I can't believe it. He has spoken blasphemy. Okay, this is what they're now, they're now charging him. This is it, this is it. He's saying he's the Messiah and he's gonna come back on the clouds. He's just a person. No way this is true. He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. He is worthy of death. This is where the signs come up and everybody's shaking their big poster boards. Worthy of death, worthy of death. Okay, and this is what everyone's doing. Then they spit in his face and they struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah. Who hit you, huh? Who hit you? Who's the one that did that? And they're all swacking at him all at once. It's like a massive gang-type beating going down here. It is getting absolutely ugly. If this ever happened in a courtroom, you better believe he'd be thrown out. But it appears that everybody's in on this one because it goes toward their false agenda, so they just ignore the rules. This is the situation that's going on. This is the whole point. Because now Peter is where? In there. He's in that courtroom. He is there watching out in that audience stands next to guards. This is what Peter is seeing. What does he get filled with? Fear and anxiety. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll be honest with you, I don't blame him. I would be too. If I see a whole bunch of people circle around someone and start whooping on them, I would begin, my heart rate would go up. My mind would be racing 100 miles a minute. I would want to think I could do something, but like I've said before, I am far from the epitome of masculinity. I am not taking on a crowd. They will, they will just beat on me too. It would be a real scary situation. What if they get mob mentality and leave that fight and come to me? Even though I got nothing to do with this right now, what if they come to me? So some of us might see that and then run. Pick up our cell phones, 911, but we're going to be running away because we're going to be filled with fear. And our mind's going to tell us a story. They're going to come after me, but are they? We don't know. But our mind's telling us a story. So Peter gets filled with anxiety and fear. And so this is where he denies Jesus three times. And we're going to see how this plays out in a moment. But I want you to see the story of this first with a couple of little details pointed out you might have missed when you've run through it really, really fast. To now number one. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. Wait a minute. Where is he? Sitting out. Remember before he went to the courtyard, then he went in and sat next? Now he's out. So he left the room. 
He left the scene. He left the violence. He went outside. So now he's sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Now I want you to notice, who questions Peter? A little junior high servant girl. That's who questions him. She's like, you know, what, 12 years old, okay? A little junior high servant girl is who's questioning Jesus. Let me ask you, who, what authority does a servant girl have? Zero. Who pays attention to what a little servant girl says? No one. Is she a threat to Peter? None at all. She just sees him leave the room. Jesus goes in. Peter goes in. They're both strangers to the land. They're, they're not, they're, they would expect, they're not strangers to the land, but they're strangers to that moment, and they're going in, and they're in there, and the guards have them. Everything is kind of awkward. It's big commotion. Peter comes out. She goes, hey, weren't you with, you were just one of, you were just in there, weren't you? And Peter's like, oh, what are you talking about? I have no idea. Okay, he's freaking out a little bit over a logical assumption made by a little junior high servant girl. And so he lies. I don't know what you're talking about. Then comes to dial number two, verse 71. Then he went out to the gateway for a, who? Another junior high servant girl. Some translations will say woman. Some translations will say young woman because some translations are really big on not being redundant. So they don't want to, they don't use the same words. So you get words like snake followed by serpent followed by slithering reptile. Okay, and so they don't like to be redundant so they'll change their words up. It's the exact same term for the exact same type of person. A little junior high servant girl, 11, 12 years old, okay, comes up. So another servant girl came up to him and said to the people there, hey, th this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. Do you think anybody's paying attention to her? No. She's probably like, hey, I think he was with Jesus. They're like, shut up. And they're just kind of like just doing their thing, right? And so he denied it. Peter denied it again with an oath this time. I swear on my mama's grave. I don't know the man. Okay, it doesn't say mama's grave, but that's like an oath, okay? Now he adds a swearing to it. Okay, not profanity here, but it's just, I swear, I swear on my mama's grave. Okay, I do not know this man. Then comes denial number three, verse 73. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, now it's not servant girls. Now it's a crowd of people. Not very big. Small little few people there. Okay, so all the while those standing there said to Peter and said, went to Peter and said, surely you're one of them. Your accent gives you away. Let's pause here. Since when does an accent determine an allegiance to Jesus? I mean, think about the evidence of that. Okay, surely you're one of Jesus' followers, right? Because you have this accent. That's like saying, hey, nice Southern Bell drawl you got there. You must be a Democrat. What? It doesn't even, what? You know, hey, I can tell by your Northern accent you like Star Trek over Star Wars. He then... You know, why would you, how would you, the accent doesn't tell you anything, right? It doesn't tell you anything. Just, it tells you maybe you're from one country or another area of the country or one region from another, but that doesn't show allegiance. That's a stupid argument. That this went to court, that's not proving anything. That's just so bizarre. Hey, nice accent there, buddy. You must be a Jesus follower. He should have went, What? But then the world do that to us all the time. They make stupid accusations based on absolutely no evidence of anything. And then we get all freaking out. And we go, oh, that's not, what, what, what? You know, and they, they'll like say racist or they'll say homophobe or they'll say whatever. And they'll throw words at us, you know, fascist and on and on it goes. And, and then Christians are like, what, 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 how and what? You know, and they just get all frustrated and upset and angry. And then they say things and it just gets stupid. Because what are the accusations based on? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, okay? It's just, it's so stupid. <laughs> it really is. But this is what people do. So they come to Peter with this false accusation like this. Your accent tells you you're one of Jesus' people. 
And does Peter say, stupid argument, man. Let's talk about real evidence. Let's have a conversation. Does he get smart like that? No. His mind is still filled with fear and anxiety. He's still painting a picture that he thinks is going to be true about him getting arrested, him being beaten, him being tortured, him being killed, him being uh, the, the social outcast, him dealing with the pain, him dealing with all this loss and sacrifice that he doesn't want to deal with. So he's freaking out. So he doesn't even pay attention at the accusation being stupid or silly. So then he began to call down curses, and he swore another oath to them. I don't know the man. Here's what this kind of looked like. He's like, now he's not just, I swear on my mama's grave. Now he's calling upon God to, to curse him if he's lying. Something like, you know, may the fleas from a thousand camel's humps infest my armpits if I'm telling the lie. You know, and, and, and aren't you glad God doesn't honor every oath we give? Because <laughs> is Peter lying? Yes! Does he know the man? Yes! And there's been so many times we'll call out an oath. God, if you just do this, if this will happen, I promise I will for the rest of my life. And then God doesn't do it. And we're like, what? And God's like, I didn't agree to that oath. You know, what? what? I didn't agree to that. You just said an oath, but I'm not agreeing to it. So sometimes we just utter out oaths. Doesn't mean God agrees. And sometimes we utter oaths out of haste. And aren't we glad when God ignores that from time to time? Especially this one. Because Peter absolutely was lying. Absolutely was lying. Now, let's talk about some interesting observations about this. I want you to notice something. Peter now gets filled with regret. And so does Judas. And on the surface, you can't tell the difference between the two. On the surface, it's really hard to tell the difference between Peter and Judas. I want you to see this. We know so well Peter gets restored. Jesus comes to Peter. Although, interestingly, Matthew does not record the restoring of Peter. We do not get in the book of Matthew, Jesus coming to Peter saying, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Do you love me? We don't get that in Matthew. We get that in the other Gospels. Matthew doesn't give us that. Matthew leaves it that we almost can't tell the difference between Peter and Judas, with the exception of Judas kills himself and Peter becomes one of the 11 again. Jesus is there at the resurrection. Jesus is there at the great, or I'm sorry, Peter is there at the resurrection. Of course, Jesus is there at the resurrection. He's the one resurrecting. <laughs> Peter is there at the resurrection. Peter is there at the great commission. So we know Peter gets reinstated with the disciples. He gets his life back on track, but we don't see it happening in Matthew. It stays kind of ambiguous. You can't tell the difference, okay? Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter betrayed Jesus. Judas feels remorse. Peter feels remorse. It looks the same. We could look at somebody who's denying Jesus or is backsliding in their faith, and we would say they're losing it, and we, can't, we don't know if they really are just wandering away from the church or if they're just struggling at a time. It's hard to tell the difference sometimes. We got some clues, we're going to see some of those. But right after the third denial, immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you would disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how, they, how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse... See, just like Peter was, right? So Judas is seized with remorse and returned the money. For somebody who idolizes money, for somebody who money is everything, for somebody who's willing to betray their friend and Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, to go back and say, I want a refund. Here's your money. Give me Jesus. Okay, that's impressive. So Judas has remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. So here's Judas saying, I did this wrong. Jesus is innocent. Here's your money back. Let him go. Our transaction null and void. All, any contract, let's rip it up. It's over. It's over. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. 
In other words, we don't accept your refund. It's like they bought it on clearance. No refunds, sorry, as is. That's what they're doing. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and he hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as the burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day, the day that Matthew's writing the book of Matthew. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, that they took 30 pieces of silver and the price uh, set on him by the people of Israel and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord had commanded me. This is the remorse of Judas. Now, there is a difference, and here's how we're going to be able to try to tell the difference. What I want us to try to wrap our brains around today is this, the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Okay, the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 10 says that worldly sorrow uh, leads to death, but godly sorrow leads to repentance. So there's a big difference, big difference. Okay, and the question is going to be whenever we recognize that we have sinned, when we recognize that we have fallen, when we recognize that we have let fear dictate our actions rather than faith in Jesus, when we get to that point that we made choices out of our own anxiety, out of our own anger or self-satisfaction or whatever it is, and we look back and we say, man, I shouldn't have made that choice. I shouldn't have done that. I should have done things differently. I wish I could go back and change it. Whatever the case is, and we're filled with sorrow, the question is, where is that sorrow going to point you? Where is that sorrow going to take you. And here's the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow, starting on the left. Worldly sorrow is centered upon self. All it does is say what you did, and it's all about you. I did this. I did that. I did wrong. And it just constantly points. The whole focus is upon you in a negative sense. That's what it does. Okay, so that's what it's centered on. The concern is on self-punishing. You deserve to lose everything. You deserve whatever comes your way. You deserve, you're just like, I just can't believe, I'm a horrible person, may I rot in hell, may I die, may I just, whatever, and you just, just, just fire me, leave me, lose me, whatever. Okay, and they just, I'm just and then they in, might even insult yourself, and that's the self-punishing. I'm a horrible, wicked, terrible person. I'm such a loser. Nobody loves me, and, and nobody should even love me. Why does anyone even want to hang around with me when I'm just such a loser? And on and on, the self-punishing and negative talk goes. And, and, and to some degree, it's right. To some degree, it's wrong. Okay, some degrees there are some accurate that you are a sinner and that you do deserve hell, but it is incorrect because it completely crosses out the grace of Christ, completely eliminates the grace of the cross, completely eliminates Jesus out of the equation because all it's focusing on is self and the self-punishing. Its concentration here is past failures. Suddenly you're able to bring up a whole slew of things of all the ways you failed before. Have you ever talked to somebody who's going through worldly sorrow and they're talking about how they screwed up and they're such a loser, then you try to tell them a compliment? Well, you know, you did this well and you did this well, and then they're somehow able to find failure in all those examples? Have you ever, ever been in that type of situation with someone? You're like, hey, you know what, but you're still a good person. Well, yeah, then why is no one doing this? And why is no one doing that? Why does nobody care? Hey, a lot of people love you. Well, they have to. They're my mom. You know, and, and they just always are finding a way to make it negative. And all they can focus on is the past failures. That's all they've got. So they're just saying, I'm a loser, I'm horrible, I'm terrible, I'm punishing myself with these bad words about myself. I've never done anything right. I screw this up, I screw that up. What's even the point? Are you sensing suicide here? This is where suicide comes from, by the way. The people who believe bullies, this is where they're at. People who commit suicide, this, this is their path. This is what it looks like. They're focused on self. All they can think about is punishing of themselves and maybe punishing other people. And they're focusing on how everything in the past is just a failure. They never do anything right. Nothing's ever going to change. Nothing's ever going to be different. This is where I'm at. This is where a lot of the suicides go. And the core emotion is anger. The core emotion here is anger. This is what is filling their heart. This is what's filling their mind, is anger. 
Anger is not a bad emotion. It's uncomfortable, but it's not a bad emotion. But Bible says very clearly, in your anger, do not sin. And anger has a tendency to lead us to many sinful paths, especially when it is part of this type of a cycle. This is where Judas is. This is where Judas is. He's focusing on himself. He is punishing himself that he's the one that, that betrayed innocent blood. All he's focusing on is his past failures. He is filled with anger. That's why you take, took the money and he threw it. That is not an action of love. <laughs> okay, that is an action of anger. This is where Judas is at. Peter, where is he at? Godly sorrow looks different. It's centered on God. Okay, godly sorrow is centered on God. It starts with, I have failed God. I have let God down. Okay, so God is part of the equation here. It is not myself that's the subject and the main focus. It is I have done something wrong, but God is my focus here. I have wronged God. So if I want to fix this, I need, if I want forgiveness, if I want any type of restitution, I need to go to God. If it's just yourself and a failure, where do you go to fix it? To yourself? You're the problem. If you're the problem, you can't be the solution. So I always find it weird when people say, I have to learn to forgive myself. Well, that seems weird because you're not the authority. That seems weird because you're, you're going to where the problem starts for the solution. Don't go to yourself for forgiveness. If God has forgiven you, that's what counts. If God has said you are forgiven and you are set free, who are you to argue that? To say that I have to forgive myself is going to kind of go on the worldly sorrow route there because you're saying that it's all focused on me and I'm the authority and I'm what matters. And that's not the case at all. So godly sorrow centers it on God. Godly sorrow has the concern for setting things right. The fancy word there to fit in my little box is restitution. That's the technical term for it. It's trying to set things right. Seek forgiveness. Seek restoration. Try to correct any wrongs that have been done, but to seek that. That's the goal. The goal isn't just how I can be punished and insulted. The goal is how can I set it right? How can I find forgiveness? How can I find healing? I'm wounded. How can I find healing? I'm broken. How can I find mending? How can I find this? And the concentration is on future changes, not on the past. You can't change the past. So it doesn't wallow in the past of everything done in the past. Instead, it says, you know what? What can be done different from this point forward? I screwed up. God, forgive me. Help me to make better choices tomorrow. Rather than wallowing in what I can't change, help me better what I can change, which is my choices of the future. And the emotion here is love. It's not anger. Oh, woe is me. Look how horrible I am. Or oh, I'm going to to the world. Instead, it's love. It's God. I love you. I wronged you. And I'm sorry that I wronged you. Help me not to wrong you anymore because I love you. It's like two spouses that had a fight. Worldly sorrow will go into self. Oh, my spouse hates me. My wife or my husband hates me. And I'm just such a loser. And, and this is just terrible. And we're never going to get this right. And all of, we've always argued here and here and here. And I always let everything down. And I'm always doing it wrong. And I'm just so filled with anger. That's worldly sorrow in a marriage. Godly sorrow in a marriage says, you know what? I screwed up and I'm sorry. Let's try to find healing. Let's try to find restoration. Let's do things differently from this point forward because I love you. Not because I'm just angry at us. I'm angry at the situation and the failure, but I love you and I want to see it be better and healthier and grow in a better direction. You see the difference of the two? You see the difference? Judas, worldly sorrow. Peter, Godly sorrow. Judas went and hung himself. Peter went and joined the 11. Well, the 10. Okay, Peter went and joined up with the disciples and continued on with Jesus. Something else I want you to notice as well. Something you may never have even just, you just missed it. Ready for this? Surprise for you. Where did Peter start before the denials? He was where? In the courtroom sitting next to the guards, watching Jesus, right? Before denial number one, they're beating up Jesus. Where does Peter go? He steps out into the courtyard, no longer into the courtroom, 
right? Denial number one. He's getting further away from Jesus, isn't he? Then he goes to the gateway for denial number two. Continues on out of the gate to the crowd, denial number three. See, here's what happens. The further from Jesus you get, the deeper in sin you get. It's like Jesus is the shore and Peter's walking deeper into the waters and he's wading out and wading out and it's getting deeper and deeper because the further from Christ you get, the deeper in sin you get. That's what it looks like. It's like that story from Thailand where I was in the ocean. The further from the shore I got, the deeper everything got and the more dangerous everything began getting. And this is what Jesus wants, is for us to turn around and go back to the shore. That's what we need to do. We need to not walk away from Jesus because we're afraid of what other people are going to think. We can't walk away from Jesus because we're afraid of how other people are going to respond. Whether we're going to lose friends or lose family or lose a job or a promotion or we're going to lose social comforts or we're going to lose safety or security because we just need to be with Jesus because that is more secure. Safer is Jesus than any raft on any ocean that you could ever find. Safer is Jesus than any boat or ship or cruiser out in the ocean you could ever find. Safer is it with Jesus. More secure is it with Jesus. It'll be out of your comfort zone. There's a lot of risk involved. There will be sacrifice, heartache, and difficulties. But safer in the arms of Jesus than out in the ocean by yourself. We cannot wade away from Jesus. And that's what Peter is doing. That's what worldly sorrow does. It walks away from Jesus out into the waters. And we need to stop, recognize where we're at, turn around and cry out to Jesus, draw me close. I need to be close to you. I need to be where you are. Because I've been too distant. So people, a pleasant view. Do not let your fear, anxiety, and regret. Notice those three words. Fear, anxiety, regret. F-A-R. Do not let those three things bring you far from Jesus. Do not let your fear, anxiety, and regret draw you far from Jesus. Instead, draw close. If nothing else, pray out to him, cry out to him, reach out to him. Draw close. That's where you will find the healing that you need. That's where you'll find the security that you need. And drawing close, not driven far. Let's have a word of prayer.